Welcome everyone to Facts and Faith Fridays. For those of you who it's your first time joining us, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope that it's not your last time. Um, today we have, like I said, a pretty jam-packed agenda, but all of interesting information and things that will help our faith leaders serve their communities and the rest of us to serve the communities with, where we live, work, and play. Um, I am Dr. Sutton. I'm not Rudine. Rudine is not with us today, but I hope that you would oblige me for our session today. Um, and so we're going to start with the opening prayer by um, Reverend Rachel Pierce. Reverend Pierce. Thank you, Dr. Sutton. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this opportunity to gather today, and we pray that you would help us to learn from one another and learn in some new ways where we can serve our schools and our students their families, our teachers, the aides, the ones who keep our schools clean and healthy, and the ones who prepare the meals for our students and for their staff. We remember each one who is working behind the scenes to make these days flow seamlessly for our students. We pray particularly for our superintendents and their safety teams who work tirelessly to keep everyone safe and to create a healthy environment for learning. May we have ears to hear and hearts that will be moved to action by their words this day. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Reverend Pierce. So generally on Facts and Faith Fridays, we start from a word um, with Dr. Wynn. And Dr. Wynn happens to be traveling today. So I'm gonna do my best, Dr. Wynn, not really impression, but what I think he would talk about a little bit today. So he had an opportunity to meet with our um, faith leaders a few weeks ago. And one um, of the topics that came up was the very topic that got Facts and Faith started a few years ago, and that was COVID-19. And so if, if you all didn't see, I guess it was a few days ago, the CDC released a report and it was on the news talking about the vaccine that is now available or will be available that will address um, the strain of COVID that we're seeing. And so I you know, highly recommend that everyone do their research. They start to learn about this vaccine. Just as we had last year, we're going to be seeing COVID, we're going to see flu, we're going to see RSV. And so start to educate yourselves. If you need information about any of these vaccines or any of these viruses, you can reach out to us. And I'm sure Reverend Pierce will drop the email in the chat. We'll be happy to provide you with information about that, um, but please start to, you know, get, get yourself ramped up for your vaccines um, and to learn more about these viruses as the fall and winter season um, are approaching. I have some more updates regarding the cancer center, some really exciting things that are happening within the next couple of weeks, but I will give um, that information at the very end of the session. So we are going to start with our first guest. We actually have some individuals here with us today that are doing some quite amazing work. They're associated with VCU and VCU Massey, but they're doing really amazing community work. And they thought this would be a great opportunity to share with you all some of the work that they're doing, particularly um, with the Chickahominy tribe. And so I'm gonna turn it over um, to Dr. Maria Thompson, who is an associate professor um, in the New School of Population Health, Dr. Thompson. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, and I'm here today with um, Suzanne Brown, who is from Chickahominy Tribal Leadership, who are our equal partners on this project. Um, and we're just excited to be here today to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. So we've been working on the Chickahominy Truth Project alongside Dr. Kathy Tosis, who is the co-PI, as well as others from the Chickahominy Tribal Center. Um, so this project aims to better understand structural and individual level contributors to cancer risk perceptions and experiences of Charles City County residents. Um, and so to do this work, we are conducting interviews, we are doing complimentary water testing in homes, um, we're mapping private wells, uh, and we have a broader county level survey that we're conducting. Um, so far, we've completed 82 out of 150 interviews. We have over 350 surveys. And so we just wanted to share just briefly, you know, what we've been doing. If there's anyone that lives or works in Charles City County that might be interested in learning more, we would love to talk. Um, but I'm actually, I'm going to cheat just a little bit and I'm going to play a video of the chief um, talking about this project. Why do we have such a high incidence of cancer 
in this area in and around the Chickahominy Tribal Center. Chickahominy Indian Tribe is very excited to be part of a project along with Massey Cancer Center. It's a truth project, which is trust, research, understand, tell, and heal. And that resonates particularly with me uh, because of the two terms, trust and heal. In order to get there, those other components must be there, they must be very viable. We will have community engagement. There will be a cadre of folks who will go door to door uh, talking to residents uh, about their experiences relative to cancer and, and how they cope with it. To gather data, to try to see if there are environmental factors that might be causing cancer and, and how they could be part of, of uh, stemming or turning that tide and do our best to eliminate those things. What we really want to do is promote life and health and this cancer research will further involve our people, will, will help enhance that level of trust to the point that uh, we can take better advantage uh, of the science that's out there. We've got to tell with the end game to be collective healing for this community and others. So that's, I mean, that's the video. He did a much better job than I did, so I, did, I wanted to play that. Um, Suzanne, I know you're on here. I don't see you. Do you have any anything else you want to add? Um, I just wanted to um, add uh, good, good evening, everyone. I hadn't said good evening to everybody. My name is Suzanne Brown, and I am a citizen of the Chickahominy Tribe, as well as an employee of the Chickahominy Tribe. And the reason that we started this uh, journey was because we had such a high incidence of cancer cases in our community. And my mom was one of those cases and we have no way to um, attribute anything that caused her cancer. And so she was one of the ones who was doing everything right, um, living an active lifestyle paying attention to her nutrition, um, no occupational hazards, you know. So if I could just spare one person from having to go through the pain that I went through and still, you know, feel so fresh um, in my heart, if I could just save someone from having to go through that pain just by this project, it was worth all the work to me. You mind if I ask you a question, Suzanne? I'm always interested. So, you know, how what how do you or the individuals in your community come about going to Massey or in or engaging Massey even on this project for those who may be interested in doing something similar? So I actually stumbled upon Massey. Um, I don't believe anything's by coincidence. I think God ordains everything that happens aligns up with what his will is. And I serve on a human trafficking coalition for the United States government. And so I met um, a um, BCU School of Nursing instructor and was talking to her and telling her, you know, about how that bothered me, that we had such a high incidence of cases here and we couldn't really attribute, you know, was it we needed more resources in this area? or um, if it was um, the education of our community, maybe they needed to know because it was natives and non-natives, not just the natives. So um, I was telling her about it and she told me that maybe it was something that I could reach out with um, Massey Cancer and speak to them about. And so we had a meeting and got it all started and, and we worked together on writing the grants. That's amazing. So I think that's really a true testament of, like, I agree with you too, how things happen, that they're ordained, ordained to happen. And so I think that is a true testament though, to how we can all work together. And part of the reason we have this platform is so that we can kind of hear each other, um, discuss things that we have going on in our own communities and see if we can all help to address those. And so I'm really happy to hear about that. I would love, cause I've, I've heard, I mean, Dr. Tosis and I, <laughs> Dr. Thompson, we talk about this, so I've heard it's a pretty amazing project. I would love for you all to come back over time and kind of give us updates about how things are going and 
what you're learning from this project. And then Dr. Thompson, you said, so in the, this is Charles City County, correct? It is, yeah. Okay, great. So for any, any, any individuals on the call, any individuals that hear this once we post it, if you have any connection to Charles City County, are interested in this project or any way, some of our faith leaders, you may have colleagues down in that area, you know, please feel free to connect with us and we'll make sure that you all get connected to Drs. Thompson, Tosis, and Ms. Brown so we can um, bring folks together. Anything else you wanted to add, Dr. Thompson or Ms. Brown? No, I don't think so. Thank you very much for having us. I'd just like to invite y'all to our 71st annual um, Fall Festival and Pow Wow. It'll be on the weekend of the 23rd and 24th um, on Saturday. It's from 12 to 6, and on um, Sunday, it's 1 to 5. Now, I'm going to put you to work, Ms. Brown. We got that. Do you mind putting in the chat for us? Sure, too? I can do All that. Right, so I, I can also email you the flyer so you can you, distribute to everybody. Perfect. Thank you so much. So thank you all both. This is really good. I'm glad to hear that this project is moving forward in a positive manner. Um, and so we are going to have that information for you all. Um, Ms. Brown will put in the chat and then we'll have information to send out an email for you. And I wanted to say, did anybody else have any questions for them before we transition to our next segment? All right. And if you do, I'm sure they'll be on maybe for a while. So you can put some questions in the chat for either of them. So we are going to move on um, to our next segment where it is a roundtable discussion. And we are so thrilled that um, while Facts and Faith, we are here to serve our greater catchment, the Massey catchment, um, and so a, a great part of the state, we are located right here in Richmond. And um, some of our leaders here were very gracious enough to join us today to have a discussion about safety in schools. And so, you know, Facts and Faith, we are very public health um, adjacent or public health type of program. We believe that education, quality education, safety within our schools and for our children absolutely contributes to the, to the health and health outcomes for all. And so we felt that this would be a great discussion to have. So I'm gonna take a moment to introduce, just brief, because our all of our superintendents and safety office, officers, they have amazing um, bios. And I literally would be up here for about 40 minutes if we talked about all of their accolades and accomplishments. But I do wanna give you a little bit of background about all of them. So first we have with us, Dr. Mervyn um, Doherty, who is the superintendent um, for Chesterfield County Public Schools. And he joined in 2018. And before coming to Chesterfield County, um, Dr. Doherty was a superintendent of Delaware's largest and highest achieving school district. I'm interested to know where that is in Delaware because I am from Westchester, Pennsylvania. So right across the line. So we could talk about that. Um, and then we have, uh, and then to give you a little bit of background about him, so he earned his doctorate in leadership in education from Wilmington, Wilmington University. He received his master's degree in administration and supervision from Salisbury University and his undergrad degree in education from Frostburg State College. Then we have with us Dr. Amy Cashwell, who serves as the superintendent of Henrico County Public Schools, and she joined in July, I believe in 2018 as well. Um, and then she um, she provides currently leadership and direction for Virginia's sixth largest school division, which has 72 schools and program centers serving about 50,000 students. Um, Dr. Cashwell earned her undergraduate degree at Longwood University, a master's and doctorate from George Washington University. And then we have with us also Mr. Jason Cameras, who serves as the superintendent for Richmond Public Schools. Um, and Ms. before coming to RPS, Mr. Cameron served in numerous senior leadership at, um, roles in the District of Columbia Public Schools. Um, and he earned his bachelor's degree from Princeton University and his master's in education from Harvard, Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, we're also very happy to have with us today, um, as we know our leaders do not serve alone. And so some of them brought some of their colleagues with them with regard to um, safety. And so I know we had, let's see if I can find them on the screen, Mr. John Beasley with us, and he is with Richmond Public Schools. And Dr. Doherty or Dr. Cashwell, do you have any other individuals with you that we that I should bring up? Uh, Mr. Mr. Glenn Pike, he's our supervisor. For there we go, yes. Yeah. So Mr. Okay. Pike is with us from Chesterfield County Public Schools. So I thank you all very much for joining us today. The way that this is gonna work, of course we have some questions for our superintendents and um, safety officers. 
We also will um, ask that if you have questions in our normal fashion, you can put them in the chat and we'll try to address them as we're going through. Um, if you would like to um, ask a question, you can let us know in the chat or you can raise your hand and so that we can acknowledge you um, and that we're not crossing all over each other. But you know, we always love for our, um, anyone that joins Facts and Faith to have, um, to be a part of the dialogue. So we're just gonna get started with this. And so one of the things like we recognize, especially those of us who are here in the Central Virginia area, that each of your districts have very unique needs and concerns when it comes to safety. And so I'm gonna ask if each of you would, wouldn't mind sharing what some of those are with regard to your own districts. And I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Doherty. I get to kick it off, great. Yes, that's right, let's go. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think, uh, and I hate to say th that they're unique because uh, when you talk to friends around the country, uh, we're all dealing with some of the same issues. Um, I think, uh, you know, we deal with a lot of things that happen in society. And so if it's happening in the neighborhoods, if it's happening in, in the areas where our students are living, those things are going to enter or try to enter our schools. And so we, we find that to be a unique challenge to make sure that we have a connection with our communities as our other colleagues do. Uh, and to look at the, our children coming in who are still recovering from the pandemic. We think it's, uh, you know, going out to our fourth week of school now, we're seeing a big change in our kids that, that are getting back to a strong academic pr presence and coming, to our, and coming back to school. But uh, they're still dealing with uh, a lot. Growing up stuff. Uh, uh, being an adolescent right now is extremely challenging. And uh, I think some of the unique challenges we have to make sure we have people in our buildings um, that are there to listen to our children and making sure that they have people to talk to uh, and making sure that uh, our children have voices uh, and that they, are, they, they know that they're part of the solution to any problems that we have. Uh, they're not the cause of the problem, they're the, the solution to the problems. And uh, I think uh, not only do I think Chuck is here, I think you do a great job in doing this, but I know our colleagues that are on also do a fantastic job of doing this as well. Great. Dr. Cashwell, anything you would like to add? Uh, my colleague from Chesterfield teed that up well. I mean, I would just build on this idea that, you know, our schools are indeed microcosms of the greater community, right? So the challenges we see around safety in the greater Richmond area uh, mirror the challenges we see in our schools. And I think, you know, what that presents for school systems is this unique challenge and balancing act, you know, thinking of the young people we serve from pre-K to age, uh, you know, high school age students and, and the developmental needs and social emotional well-being needs um, is balancing that safe environment that's welcoming and nurturing, but also is prepared for any circumstance. So we think about, you know, issues with gun violence. It could be a weather emergency and really balancing that with our young people so they feel, um, again, safe and um, they have trusted adults around them, but I, I think it's ever more a challenge. Uh, and again, not unique to Henrico. I think this is something all school systems face is that balancing act, right? And making sure uh, we create those environments, but we're having drills to prepare for emergencies, but also again, building, you know, you don't want kids to be frightened, but you want them to know they're cared for. We're well prepared in an emergency and we're safe. So I'd say that balancing act is, is a unique challenge schools face. Mr. Beasley, is there anything that you would like to add with regard to Richmond? Just so everyone knows, I just started this back in June, beginning of June. I, I came on board here after being a police officer in the city for 27 years working for the lottery. So to me, what they've said is very accurate. Uh, it's that community, those issues that, that come into the schools that we have to, to combat. Um, but yeah, they've really hit it on the head, and, I, and we call it unique. But I think we all do face those those same challenges. Right. I think it's nice that the messaging is pretty clear, though. So I have a child who attends Henrico schools, and this is something that the principal um, says. So every time we come in or we have community meetings, the principal reminds us. His parents are asking about things with safety. He reminds us that um, that it's pretty much if we look at our community that we live in it's going to be a mirrored reflection. And I think that's a nice reminder to us as sometimes the expectation is we think things should be different at the schools and there should be like, it's a nice, it's a nice reminder. So I appreciate that there's actually consistency in the messaging and it's absolutely, um, it's absolutely correct. Um, I believe uh, Mr. Cameras, are you on? 
I think so, am I? Yes, you are. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, I want to give you an opportunity to chime in on the question that we were asking about um, some of the, and what your colleagues are saying, not so unique, but we had the phrase as the unique needs or concerns when it comes to safety with regard to Richmond Public Schools. Well, thank you for the opportunity to participate. I'm sorry, I'm not on Zoom. I'm just uh, having some tech issues today. But um, as it pertains to your question, you know, and, and I was able to hear a little bit of my colleagues and I think they hit it uh, right on the head that often what is going on in neighborhoods and communities is what we end up seeing in schools. And unfortunately, we have a lot of challenges in many of our communities, certainly here in Richmond. And all of those, all of those challenges became more acute during the pandemic. And so we're seeing record levels of mental health issues and that in turn leads, unfortunately, to um, some of the poor decision making by some of our uh, young people and community members, which which cause concern. And so we have been working really, really hard, really on, on two fronts. One is to make sure we have all the infrastructure, people and protocols in place to keep our schools safe, but also to really continue our investment in mental health professionals because we believe firmly that kids who um, feel healthy and have a healthy, strong relationship with a caring adult are far more likely to seek help rather than um, make a poor decision that could end up um, causing a, a safety issue. So. Again, trying to trying to confront it from from both of those angles, and um, continue to support our kids as as they go through some some really tough things. Yeah. So, Mr. Cameras, while I have you, I'm going to ask a question, and I'm going to ask your your colleagues as well. From um, one of our Facts and Faith members, Reverend Tyron Williams, was asking, "What are the most significant challenges you face with regard to maintaining a safe environment for your school?" Well, I think one of the the biggest challenges we face is threading the needle between um, putting all the safety infrastructure we can in place and also not making our schools feel like hardened institutions. We want mm -hmm. kids to uh, feel welcomed and loved and excited when they come to school, um, not that they're, you know, walking into a prison or some other high security facility. And that's just a really difficult uh, needle to thread. Um, obviously, we wanna always like, err on the side of caution, um, but we also wanna make sure that our, our schools continue to feel like school. Um, yeah. And as I said, not, not like a hardened institution. Yeah, Dr. Cashwell, anything to add with Dr. Reverend Williams' question? Uh, and I agree with um, Jason, his sentiments exactly. And, and I think I was speaking a bit to that, you know, that balancing act of safety, but this welcoming environment and this culture of trust and community we want to build in our schools. I'd say an additional challenge um, would be um, a thinking about, you know, certainly we're academic institutions for, you know, teaching and learning, and that's our primary role. We want to make sure kids are learning and growing um, and getting the highest quality instruction. And we also want to have those wraparound services that they need for social, emotional health and well-being, you know, school counselors and social workers on our team, um, making sure that students with greater needs in those areas are getting that. I think the challenge becomes balancing this need that is greater than we've ever seen before. And so while we, you know, and Henrico have added, you know, my goodness, and the triple digits to our counseling staff and social workers and school psychologists and, um, you know, really trying to create these um, support teams in our schools to meet those ever-growing needs that students bring to school because we know those need to be addressed in order them for them to be able to learn and to be their best. Um, but it's hard to keep up with that. And I think, you know, the challenge is then making sure we're 
plugging our families uh, and students, you know, why we might wrap those supports around them during the school day, but how do we continue those supports for the family uh, outside of the school day, after school hours, and make sure that um, those, those supports, which are often critical for students um, to receive, are not just happening in school, um, but outside as well. Yeah. Dr. Dowdy, anything to add? Well, it's interesting because everybody's going to hear the same thing from all of us. Because <laughs> one thing about it, we will all deal with the same families at some times, it seems, mm -hmm. uh, because how transient people are. But I think uh, for us also to, to stay ahead of the game in the sense of to, to stay proactive uh, and to make sure that we are anticipating some of the needs that are coming and make sure that uh, we're not we're not chasing the wagon uh, to catch up uh, because that's where it hurts our children. I know everyone's been placing more counselors, workers, and building uh, more outreach opportunities. Uh, we are extremely excited that the governor is putting more money in education, except, you know, uh, whether it would be enough. Uh, I don't think we can ever have enough money to make sure our kids have the services that they need uh, in that area. And I think uh, Amy uh, made a good point about making sure that our families are engaged with us, that they understand. And that the parenting is extremely challenging right now. Uh, and to make sure that our parents feel supported, uh, but we also want them to pick up their game, bring their own game with them, uh, and talk to their children and find out what's going on. As I tell everybody, we get a report card every day when the child goes home, and that's okay. And I'd rather our parents talk to the kids, see how they're doing, know how they're feeling, uh, making sure things are going well in school. Uh, we only get to see them seven and a half hours a day. And so that parent support is extremely important. And there, there's been a big push for getting more parents involved, getting them engaged, uh, and, and keeping them in, in conversation. As you know, as your child gets older, they speak less to you. So how do we get them to speak more to, to the adolescents especially? Yeah, that's a good point. So Dr. Dowdy, I'm going to bounce on that a little bit. So um, what do you, what can you say that your, some of your schools may be doing to try to increase or enhance that, that parental participation or parent engagement? Because I hear that from teachers across the board, you know, especially with like back to school nights just happening. And they're like, oh, you know, we didn't have many parents or we did. And so like, what kind of, you know, what maybe can you all do or are you all thinking to do to try to increase that engagement? All right. Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> I, I was hoping you did. Uh, the, uh, one of the things, um, that sometimes everyone has a misconception is that that back to school night and open house and yeah, we did it and that's it. That, we don't want to see you again. So I can tell you what we're trying to do. Uh, we, you know, we have a campaign called Better Together that we're reaching out to our family community engagement people are out there, our schools are out there, our community members that are involved, our faith leaders. Uh, we're out there talking to everyone about, we do this together. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a campaign decades ago about, you know, it takes a, a village to raise a child. That, that's a very true statement, even more today than ever. And so, you know, by us pushing our campaign out there, getting parents involved, uh, getting parents to say, we want you to volunteer. You know, we don't, I'm not asking for money, I'm asking for your time. Mm -hmm. And the more uh, community volunteers we can get in buildings, the more parents we can get to volunteer buildings, the more faith leaders we can get involved in the buildings uh, to just be with our kids. Uh, coming in once a week to sit down with a child for 30 minutes and talk to them, and maybe help them with a subject area or just you know, talk about a book they were reading, goes to light years to helping that child uh, feel that people care about them. And so the more people, the more adults we can get involved with our children that show that we, we care about them, we love them, we want them to be great, that there's light at the end of the tunnel and there's hope, the better the, better the school system is. There's not a yeah. school system that's, that can do anything in an isolation. And that's why you'll see all of us, we talk all the time about ideas. We're not creating new ideas. We're stealing from each other things that people are doing because they work. And so the opportunity that we have to keep reaching out and keep getting involved. And a lot of our parents sometimes feel that the schools don't want them involved because they may have had a bad experience where they were in school somewhere. And so our, one of our challenges is to make sure that we draw you in as much as possible. And that's either by making sure we have interpreters in our school to help with our very diverse population to making sure that our communications not only go to our families, as we send out a, a magazine to all of our residents four times a year saying, hey, here's our school system. You don't have any kids in it, but would you like to be involved? It's amazing how many people who don't have children who are retired or past their state but want to come back and help, they just need to be asked. So 
I think um, getting getting the adults more engaged, more involved, it's okay. It's okay for people to come in and help us. Absolutely. Dr. Cashwell, anything that you all and Henrico may be particularly doing with regard to engagement? Yeah, similarly, you know, certainly from the global perspective across our um, 73 schools, you know, thinking about our family and community engagement efforts and outreach, um, you know, make sure we're offering um topics that our families tell us they're interested in, mental health workshops, how to, you know, become involved, uh, literacy workshops, whatever it may be, and really helping foster this idea of the community school at we at each one of our schools and centers. And so we've really been leaning into that and helping support our principals and school teams and understanding what it looks like to engage, you know, uh, your caretakers, parents, families, guardians, uh, your community partners, faith-based leaders, uh, again, as um, Dr. Daughtry spoke to that all hands on deck approach, you know, it takes everyone um, to strengthen that school community and understanding um, the unique needs each school community has. I mean, it would be unfair to say that all Henrico schools need the same thing. So while we provide certainly a strong family and community outreach and avenues for open communication, we want to empower our school-based teams from the principal to the teacher to understand the unique needs of each family. Family, uh, make sure their voices are heard, that we're listening to the caretakers and what is it they need, whether it's translation services, maybe it's a grandparent uh, raising a child who needs a unique level of support and just really um, making sure there's space for that. We're honoring their um, the value they bring to the table and prepared to help uh, meet them where they are. Absolutely. Mr. Cameras, anything you would like to add about Richmond? Uh, it's hard going after my colleagues because um, they all have such great things to say, and I agree with them wholeheartedly. Um, uh, only extra point I'll make, as Amy was talking about translation and, and such, we work really, really hard to um, increase the number of uh, bilingual folks we have on the team to make translation and interpretation really, really easy and accessible to our families. We know that language continues to be a, a barrier for engagement. And so um, we're working very hard on that. Also, we are spending a lot of time going to our families rather than having them come to us. So uh, community walks in the neighborhood, events uh, in the neighborhood at apartment complexes and so on. And we have found that to be effective because as with everybody, uh, families are busy and don't always read every bulletin that goes out and so if we can go to them um we're more likely to to get some of the engagement that we all are seeking absolutely so i'm going to let you go first with this one and then your colleagues have to follow you so okay. um, <laughs> are there any pilot programs that maybe rps has considered or implemented to address um school safety well uh we have a a lot of things uh, that are currently uh, in place. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me just do a quick rundown. Um, so as, as with my colleagues, um, of course, we have access control to, uh, to our schools. Um, everybody needs to sign in. We do background checks through a computer system when people come. We have um, added swipe card access to doors so that teachers um, don't have to and frankly can't prop open doors. Um, we've upgraded all of our intercom systems, camera systems, uh, installing a essentially panic button system uh, amongst many, many other things. We also have um, what we call care and safety associates through their school-based uh, security that um, really work to develop relationships with our kids and try to prevent things from happening in the first place, but they're also available and well-trained in the event that anything does happen. We've made digital maps of all of our schools and share them with the city's emergency uh, management team so that they're available to police and fire in the event that they need to um, respond to an emergency so they know exactly where everything is. Uh, so uh, a whole host of measures uh, like that some of the things that we were hoping to pilot this year, um, uh, which may sound tangentially related to safety, but but I think my colleagues would agree it is not, um, that is trying to get 
um, cell phone usage uh, more limited. And so we're going to explore pilot in a few school. Um, the basically it's a cell phone patch. Any of you pouch? Any of you have gone to concerts or whatnot where you have to put your cell phone in a pouch for the concert so you can't video. Um, this is something that we're going to pilot at a few of our schools to see if we can um, cut down on um, the incidence of um, you know all the social media postings and such during the school day, which can um, often lead to escalation where um, without that, perhaps um, things wouldn't get to the point that they do. So um, that's one thing. We're also um, partnering with a local um, uh, nonprofit to basically develop, um, have our high school kids develop PSAs to their peers about um, everything from um, gun violence to um, sexual assault to um, you know, conduct within schools and so on, um, to try to give a, a voice to our kids um, so that they can share with each other um, some, some expectations and um, aspirations as well. So those are just a yeah. couple of things that we're piloting. We have lots more, but I'll, I'll stop there and let my, my colleagues jump in. Great, and I have some follow-up questions on a few things. Um, Dr. Cashwell, anything in addition that you want to add for him, Riko? Uh, I would add, similar to all the things that were just mentioned related to the nuts and bolts, right? We are often piloting, you know, new um, rapid notification systems for families. We have um, all of those in place, right? We have securely monitoring um, safety and security on the internet when students have school devices. We have access control systems, vestibule entryways. So I won't rehash those kinds of things. I think they're really similar to what you just heard. Um, but building off this concept, um, you know, that was noted related to students actually being involved with PSAs. I'll, I'll talk about some of the work um, that that's similar in that we're really leaning into um, elevating student voice in this. I think a lot of times in my experience, a lot of adults around the table trying to brainstorm solutions. What do we need more of? How can we secure, you know, what does students need and they need more mental health support and all of these things, but really leaning into student voice in this. And so we did have our students doing some work, um, student to student messaging with PSAs, but something I'm really proud of, um, and it actually involves uh, my colleagues. So I'll speak to this. In Henrico, we started um, a youth crime and violence task force last year as the police chief, the county manager, and myself. And really digging into this idea of interagency cooperation, right? Because as we said, community issues really around safety are school issues of safety. They're not unique to schools. They're happening in the community and in our schools. And so uh, we were really digging into that. And anyway, this idea of student voice came to be, and we talked about, we were showing a lot of the PSAs and this idea of a teen summit or a youth summit RVA came about. And we talked about how about we broaden it outside of Henrico, right? These are issues facing students in Richmond Public Schools and Chesterfield Public Schools. So um, it was held at the convention center in Richmond. We sponsored an event where students generated the topics. We brought in speakers to address them. We gathered feedback. Um, Merck actually helped us put together a report to analyze that data. Um, students will be involved from across the region and planning next year's summit and really digging into these issues around mental health, safety, and violence, and um, really elevating their voice on this topic. Nice. Very good to hear. We would love to hear more about the summit as it's approaching and would love to share it widely. So we'll make sure to stay in contact with that in that regard. And Dr. Dougherty, now you're at the end. Uh, do you have anything in addition to add with regard to Chesterfield? No, I think uh, we all uh, are thinking outside the box of what we do with making sure our schools are secure, that people just can't walk in the buildings from the door swipe to camera entrance to and put cameras inside and out to vestibules that you cannot walk in the building at the, the office to checking everyone's ID and uh, making sure that we are not letting, letting people come into the building that shouldn't be in the building to uh, immediate uh, reaction devices uh, to then respond to 911. Again, I, I and they both talked about it, but it, it's a strong emphasis that we need to know our children. And I think that's one thing our schools, our teachers, our administrators, our security people do well. They know our kids. 
And when you see a young person having a challenging time, that's being proactive and, and trying to make sure that, that you get ahead of the game. And when you see kids alone, when you see them, you know, we should never see kid at the cafeteria for breakfast or lunch sitting by themselves. What's wrong here? Mm -hmm. uh, that, um, you know, school should be, this should be an enjoyable time for them. Uh, we have one thing that I have uh, almost 30 high school students that are on my SAGE program, and, and we, we meet with them every month. I meet with them every month. They're actually doing a research project this year on, on two major points. One is absenteeism, and one is on uh, better school safety. What, do they feel safe in the school? Do our students feel safe in the school? I can run all the reports I want, but uh, these guys love doing projects uh, that they can present, and uh, we're looking forward to them working this year. Uh, what I think is great, what my team think is great, how do they feel? And so we're really going to answer a lot of ways, just like the other, the other school systems are doing. Okay. So I'm going to circle back to um, Mr. Cameras. So you mentioned this, I, and I think I'm a little ambivalent about it, so I'm interested in your, you know, some feedback maybe. So you mentioned the cell phone usage. Um, and I and we talked a lot about parent engagement and student engagement. And so I'm wondering if you've gotten any feedback from students about potentially moving to putting their cell phones away and, um, and even parents, because I'm sure there's some parents on the call that are like, mm, I like to be able to contact my student when I want to. So if you can give us some um, some thoughts about that, maybe things that you all have done to try to like feel out this potential policy. Yeah, I I. Certainly, um, have heard um, a lot of, of feedback around this. And to be clear, we're going to be piloting, piloting it in the second semester. And one of the things we'll we'll do is to see exactly how folks uh, respond. I do know from my high school student advisory cabinet that this is not a very popular idea with kids. <laughs> um, I've found that parents and caregivers are mixed. Um, as you noted, many want to be able to contact their kids at any time and all times, um, but others understand the implication of having um, so much distraction and often negative distraction going on during the day. To be clear, we're not um, we're not uh, denying access uh, through the pilot um, for the entire day, but. Um, for chunks of the day. So we're gonna try that initially and see how that goes, perhaps just um, within each class. We'll try a couple of different models, um, see what seems to work best, and then, and then we'll make some decisions uh, based on all the feedback we get. So what is the evaluation for something like that? What are you ultimately looking to see occur? Like how will you all determine if it's successful? Well, we'd like to see a, a, a reduction in um, some of the um, unfortunate behaviors that we sometimes uh, see at schools and uh, an improvement in mental health uh, amongst our kids. And so we're working out how exactly we'll measure that, um, whether it's through surveys and other data collection. Um, so those are some of the things that we'd be looking for. Okay, sounds good. I would love to hear more about that. Um, okay, so we actually have a question from um, one of um, Reverend Williams. So he asked, because this is Suicide Prevention Month, um, are there specific programs or initiatives in place to address mental health concerns that students can avail themselves to? And I'll start with Dr. Cashwell on this one. Sure. Um, and I'm trying to think of all of them at once. And I know my <laughs> colleagues will fill in because we are we're engaged in similar work. But, you know, one of our biggest um, pushes over the past few years, and particularly coming out of the pandemic, was this idea of normalizing conversations around mental health and well-being and wellness. And, um, you know, really understanding that, you know, more and more students were facing a crisis in this area and, and welcoming those conversations and having safe spaces for those in our schools. 
Um, so we do have mental health and wellness support teams at our schools. We have an anonymous alert system where if students see something, they can report it. If they need help, they can ask for it that way. If it's something where they feel they need to initiate it in an anonymous way. But ultimately, it's creating um, strong relationships. I think this ties back to the safety conversation, right? Safe schools are places where every adult, I mean, every student rather knows at least one trusted adult they can go to if they're finding themselves in crisis in any way. Um, there's a safety concern. Um, certainly our school-based mental health teams um, have robust supports in place. We do a lot of education for the community caregivers, um, you know, in fact, we had a number, our, our family and community engagement uh, team Wednesday night hosted a session on this for parents. We brought in expert speakers, try to make those resources available to families who need, you know, want to learn more about how they can um, not only be aware, but deal with these issues that um, their young people are experiencing at home and in school and many of those challenges. So um, any number of ways, and that just touched on some of them. Okay, Dr. Dowdy, anything you want to add to that? No, I think uh, everyone is is fully aware of the need that our students have and to make sure that we have the people in, in the facilities uh, in each of our schools to make sure that they're there for our children and they have access uh, to the counselors, to the teachers, to people that can help them. Um, uh, they, there's only so much that you can do, uh, but this just isn't for this month. We do this 180 days a year, and a lot of times in the summer, we're working with students who are in our schools as well. And the opportunity is to keep it on the forefront and pushing the envelope to, you know, to make sure that we have the qualified people, that we are, again, staying ahead of the game on this as much as possible, make sure that not only are we working with the students, but when our students do have a, a crisis, that makes sure that our parents are fully aware of it and that our parents know that they can get help. And as Amy was talking about, an access to uh, information, the opportunity to contact us, the opportunity to have those abilities to get help. The more, so I think sometimes the awareness of I need help, how do I get it is extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, and if a student and a family needs that, we want to make sure that they are aware that they can get help for that crisis. Or if to avert a crisis, that they're just seeing not just my child's an adolescent, they're acting strange, but there's some other things going on, I need help. And that's why I partnerships with our county health agencies, the hospitals, with doctors, pediatricians, are extremely important as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to give an opportunity for um, individuals on the call if you all have questions. I have one more question for our superintendents, but before I ask that, does anyone else have questions for them? Okay, so we are very much so a community of, we, we like to bring in individuals so that we learn, um, so that we can potentially collaborate. Um, and then we're very much so about action. So one of the things I wanna ask each of you is um, what, if anything, do you believe that this Facts and Faith Fridays community, which is comprised of scientists, researchers, faith leaders, lay community leaders, um, what, if anything, can we do to help support um, your districts um, as you pursue safe spaces for students and teachers and et cetera? Oh, okay, Dr. Dowdy raises it. <laughs> Yes, I, you can I, go I first. Sure this you know, and, and that, and thing, I knew that was coming. I knew the question was coming, so I've been excited for this question the whole time. Um, and, and, and this comes up a great deal. This question is asked a lot of us. Your time and energy are the most important thing we can give. Now, you're a faith organization, so we don't forget praying for us every day. Um, but the key is, a lot of people say they want to help, and they, they don't get up. And so I'm just being truthful with you. I need people to say, I want to help, and I'm willing to do it. And our, our, we just can't be uh, about a, a meeting and discussion. We have to be about boots on the ground. And the more people that we get to buy in, to come into our schools, 
to see the unbelievable things that occur in our schools and also get to know our kids. You fall in love with our kids. It doesn't matter if it's pre-K, if it's middle school, or if it's high school. You will fall in love with the kids in these schools. They're phenomenal kids. They're going to be phenomenal leaders. Doesn't matter where they're from. Doesn't matter zip code. Doesn't matter card. Doesn't matter race. They're phenomenal kids. But we need the community to invest time in our in our children. And that shows our children that people care about us because they're tired of hearing lip service mm. and they want help. So mm-hmm. the more that we can get you guys to get the word out, when people want to say something about school, the first question I would say, have you been in a school? Have you volunteered in a school? Do you know what our kids are like? Most of the time they say no. I said, okay, I'm signing you. What school do you live near? Let's go. You don't have to pick one. I'll find you. It's right around the corner from you. Go and get it. All right. Dr. Cashwell. Agree. I've (laughs) talked about every student having a trusted adult. Sometimes it's a staff member. Sometimes it's a combination of a volunteer mentor uh, that may come into the building or tutors who work with our young people after school. So yes, any kind of involvement or engagement at um, in, in whatever that may be. I understand everybody's ability to give time and talent may look differently. Maybe it's serving as a, a job shadow, career coach, whatever it might be. We have students that have a variety of needs all across the continuum and so love when we're able to um, plug volunteer community members in either as mentors or uh, informally or formally so and I would also say um, you know huge thanks for hosting this panel and allowing us to be a part of this conversation because you know another I think important um, way we uh, can share the message that issues for the school are issues for the community, right? The schoolhouse in in the community, we talked about that related to safety, but it's bigger than that. And so anything you can do to help perpetuate that message that, you know, we all have a shared responsibility for um, keeping our young people safe and well, um, both in school and out. And so while schools are prepared to do our part. We value the connection with the community to make that happen. We we value it so greatly and, and, and appreciate, again, just even opportunities to elevate issues and have open discussion in forums like this. Absolutely. Mr. Cameras. Um, again, I wholeheartedly agree with Amy and Merv. Um, and I'll just say, um, uh, Someone of the Jewish faith, I'll, I'll quote um, Rabbi Heschel, who was an activist. Um, and when asked uh, by Dr. King um, upon his return um, from the march uh, from Selma to Montgomery, Dr. King said, did you find time to pray? And Rabbi Heschel responded, I prayed with my feet. And so my ask is that everybody prays with their feet to to my colleagues, um, comment, get out there and help in any way you can. And march and advocate and do everything you can to ensure that our schools and all of the other social agencies that support our kids get the resources that they need to effectively care for our children. And we know that um, according to the General Assembly's own research arm, Virginia's schools are grossly underfunded. So pray with your feet, get out there and uh, raise your voice and demand the resources and the supports that our kids deserve. Very nice. I like that. Pray with your feet. So this is, that was a good way to close. And what we're going to do, actually, because many of you, you all said the same thing about getting out there and, you know, walking the walk and getting out there and helping out. So we, um, Reverend Pierce, work with all of your teams to get you here today. We'll probably reach out to those individuals just to get some information about volunteering and what everybody could do. And we have a nice list of individuals, both on this call and those who couldn't make it. And we'll put that out there so that hopefully we can galvanize some some feet to get out there and get to work. So I wanna thank each of you for joining us today, um, taking the time to educate us about what's going on in our region. Hopefully we can definitely have you all back another time. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So thank before you. we close out Facts and Faith family, we have a special announcement. I got an, an email about this really interesting event that's coming up. 
And I thought it would be excellent for us to share it up here. So we have with us today, um, Dr. Susan Gooden, who is the Dean, and I wanna make sure I get the school correct. She's the Dean of the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs here at VCU. And I received some information um, from some individuals in her school about an event that was coming up that I thought may interest you. So Dr. Gooden, are you on? I am, I'm here, thank you there so much. And uh, hello, Facts and Faith Fridays community people. We really appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to be able to share uh, this exciting event with you. So on Thursday, September the 28th, we are hosting our Wilder Symposium that will be on the campus of VCU from 5 to 6.30. And it is being hosted by Governor Wilder. The topic is HBCUs and the absence of support. So focusing on the historical and contemporary under support of historically black colleges and universities. As you can see before you, we have an all-star group of speakers, panelists. It'll be moderated by Bob Holsworth. We will be joined by President Frederick of Howard University, Judge Gregory from the Fourth Circuit, our Attorney General, Jason Miares, and then our RISE Director, uh, Nikina Douglas Glenn, Director of the, uh, Re the Research Institute for Social Equity. So wanted to let everyone know about this event, Thursday, September the 28th at the Singleton Center for Performing Arts uh, on here on campus from 5 to 6.30. I hope you'll be able to join us. This sounds like an amazing event. Like I said, when I got the emails, I go, this sounds really good. So we are going to make sure that everyone that is that joined today, everyone else will get access to that because Thank Dr. You. Gooden had a, a QR code up there and, a, and I'm sure there's a link. So we'll send that out soon after this call because it's next Thursday. So hopefully you all have time. Um, Dr. Gooden, is it only in person or is it hybrid? It will be live stream and it's actually two Thursdays from now, the 28th. Two oh, I'm rushing the month along. My goodness. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> so two Thursdays from now. And that's good that it's live stream also. So we'll make sure that our whole Facts and Faith community gets that um, email. Thank you so much for sharing that with Thank us today. Thank you. So before we get have our closing prayer from Reverend Gilliam, just two announcements for you all. Um, if you have been on any of the socials and you're following Massey, you have seen us talk about our comprehensive carnival event. It's going to be a very fun event. Um, it's our way of, of celebrating reaching comprehensive status. And of course, we could not have done that with, in, without you all. So we want you all to join us. That's September 23rd from 1 to 4 p.m. It's going to be at the Siegel Center here at VCU. And then on October the 26th at 7 p.m., we'll actually have our an in-person Facts and Faith for the month. So we're, do, we're doing a collaboration with Notre Dame, and it's, a, it's the Hesburgh Lecture Series, and we're going to focus on end-of-life care planning. So we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts of that, from what we can do to prepare for end-of-life to the legal aspect of it as well. And so we that will be hosted at Fifth Street Baptist Church in their sanctuary, and you will get information about that too. Um, and I want to ask Reverend Gilliam now if he would go ahead and close us out in prayer, please. All right. Thank you again to um, our local um, superintendents and, and safety and security staff for being with us today. Uh, we appreciate the work that you do. Let us pray. <laughs> Holy and most wise God, we are grateful for, um, for this day, for this opportunity to share, to learn, uh, and to grow together, to gain more information, uh, on how we can better support um, our, our schools as faith leaders, as community members, as those who are invested uh, in, in our next generation of leaders, of doctors, of lawyers, of uh, professors, of, um, of bus drivers, of, of those who will be, uh, be those taking care of us. Uh, we are grateful for, for uh, all that has been shared about uh, keeping them safe in ways that we can be engaged as a community. We pray um, for uh, for each of the each of the superintendents, each of the staff members, uh, and the 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 school districts they represent, God, that you would continue to cover them, um, and and that you would cover our cover our students and staff as they work diligently to ensure that our uh, young people are educated here in the region. Um, and we pray for all of us who need who that we might uh, heed the words that uh, Mr. Cameron shared with us um, from uh, Rabbi Hessel. Um, that we would not only pray in our churches, pray in our private time, but that we would also pray uh, with our feet by showing up and being present uh, and active in our schools and in our community. Uh, we thank you for this time, for the Facts and Faith family and leadership that's gathered today. So your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining us. And I hope to see you all at the carnival in a couple of weeks. Have a good one.